Dr. Mensing, how are you this afternoon, sir? American military personnel or something. I went last night and watched, is it 13 hours? 13 hours? hours? Oh, did you see that? Oh, my gosh. Oh, man, what'd you think? You know, you... uh, it just gives you a lot of respect for these guys. Yeah, it does. You know, I mean, just. I have not seen the movie yet. I've read yeah. segments. I've read portions of the book online. And uh, I know the story fairly well from reports from, because this was all gathered from the, the ones that survived. Yeah. That were not allowed to talk to the media until just last year. And it's amazing there's story. an awful you know, lot kind of, of details the in there. The thing that kind of amazed me, uh, I went at seven last night to seven, I don't know, seven something. Anyhow, uh, there were only probably about eight people in the show. In, in the, the theater? I, to me, oh, I, I just said, oh, my gosh, what's good? There's something wrong here. You know, it was so this good. is a movie everybody should see, like American Sniper was. Yeah. It, it just gives you a picture of what really happened, what was going on there. And you know, at least for me, I, you come out with just tremendous respect for these guys. Yeah, incredible. You know? And it sort of gives you a picture of how the government, I would say, doesn't operate. It doesn't <laughs> operate sure properly. Right no, no, no it's true. It's true. <laughs> or, or how, can, you know, how the bureaucracy rules, can... <laughs> the rules of engagement. Well, you know, it's, I can't even say rules of engagement because, you know, if we, if we, we can really only speculate as to why this happened and why the White House turned their back on these men. But all indication seems to be that Chris Stevens was involved, Obama and Clinton were involved in running guns into Turkey for the Syrian rebels, and that this was in, in response to that. And rather than just before the election let the truth come out about what the White House and the State Department was doing, they decided to just let these guys go and blame it on a freaking video. Which was nonsense. Which was nonsense. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm, I did, we didn't get a chance to talk much before I went on uh, we started this uh, top of the hour. Uh, Dr. Mensah came in in the middle of the last segment, but uh, I had to jump up and I had to go to visit the men's room. Uh, had an urge. La toilette. La toilette. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and appropriately, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're going to talk about something that I've been wanting to talk to you about for a while because I think I may suffer from it. Well, you know, Jazz, it's interesting. 16%, some studies up to 16%. I mean, think of that. That's... Uh, one in every five and a half people yeah. uh, that you see have irritable bowel symptom uh, problems. I mean, that's that's amazing, all right? And what we're going to do, we're going to talk about sort of the new things about irritable bowel syndrome. Number two, what is it and how you go about it. But more than that, at the very end, I have 11 recommendations mm. you know, that, you know, imagine if you can listen to these 11 recommendations and look at, in fact, I'd recommend people get a pen and write, you know, a write, paper it and write it down towards the end of what these 11 recommendations are. Uh, there's, uh, that co- it sort of covers... Uh, irritable bowel syndrome, where to go. It's, uh, it's not easy to, uh, to treat, uh, and it's got an interesting history. In the 1950s, it was called spastic colitis. Okay. And everybody thought it, you were crazy in your head or it was an emotional problem. Uh, really? Yes. In the 1960s, it was changed to spastic colon. And then uh, it, uh, 1970s is when we first, it was called irritable bowel. All right. In the 1980s, it went to irritable bowel syndrome. syndrome. And then in the 1990s, it, we changed it, and it was called functional bowel disease. We got rid of irritable bowel syndrome. Oh, dear. That, and it wasn't, that, don't, that don't sound good, Doc. No, and then in the uh, early 2000s, it went back to irritable bowel syndrome. What, with, was the, what uh, changed? With constipation and with, without constipation or mixed or with diarrhea. And essentially, It's weird how the combination yeah, works yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Essentially, before we kind of... We lumped it all together. We didn't really understand the pathophysiology of what was happening. And there's some new things out, just really new. In fact, we'll go over those in just a minute, of what the, really what's happening, all right? Because uh, it, you know, when I went to medical school, everybody kind of uh, thought there was an emotional problem in that. And there is an emotional comp- component. Don't get me wrong. There is. But that's not the whole answer. And probably the inter- most interesting thing is that we know that an acute gastroenteritis, like a viral flu syndrome or uh, even uh, bacterial infections of the gut, can start irritable bowel syndrome, all right? And mm-hmm. then ever after that, you have IBS. And that kind of, that's start where they first, uh, uh, where they started looking at infectious etiologies to this, all right? Well, what they have found is there's something called a, a cytolethal distending toxin. It's called CDTB. But make a long story short, this toxin that comes from... Uh, this gastroenteritis, from whatever reason, all right, viral, bacterial, whatever, this toxin, this distending toxin, literally causes autoimmunity to something in our nerves and our gut. 
called vin, uh, <coughs> vinculin, but it's essentially so these are nerve fibers in the gut that this toxin affects these vinculin fibers or these vinculin. Uh, uh, I, saw, I was going to say fibers. They're not really fibers, but these receptor sites mm -hmm. on these nerves. Uh, and literally, it's what causes it. And that's what causes the gut motility problems, bacterial overgrowth, and we have irritable bowel syndrome. So the most interesting thing that's come out of this is that we bottom line now understand that part of the pathophysiology of how this occurs is there may be bacterial overgrowth. The bacterial overgrowth from a poor gut uh, bacterial, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, flora, that's a big word for saying, you know, what the background, uh, uh, what your, uh, the bugs are good and bad in your gut are like. Okay. Uh, if those get out of whack, then you can cause toxins to some of these bugs that literally cause irritable bowel syndrome. So how do you treat it? Well, let's, let's, you before, said it's difficult to yeah, treat. Well, how do you treat well, let's, it? Well, let's, let's, before we do that, I want you to think, we are now, this is, just coming out, and it's not available everywhere, all right? But we are now able to do a test, essentially checking for this antibody uh, that you can do a blood test for, all right? And uh, the good thing about that is now we're able to diagnose for sure is it irritable bowel versus something else? Okay. Like, uh, what else could it be? Well, there's a lot of GI motility issues. Uh, there's a problem with inflammatory bowel disease. That's a big word for saying uh, uh, bowel disease it causes inflammation in the lining of the gut, which can turn to cancer, a whole bunch of bad things. Uh, uh, celiac disease can present like irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, uh, celiac sprue, uh, gluten, uh, gluten, mild gluten intolerance can uh, present like it. Uh, lactose intolerance can present a lot like it. So it's a simple way of sort of probably in the next five years, this will be available everywhere. But it'll be a simple test to say you got it or you don't. And where do we go from there? Well, what if you don't have it? Then, then you have there's to, all then, those other then, possibilities. Then, yes, exactly. What, well, what it will mean in the long run, it will save a lot of money. Okay. And, and here's why, Jazz. Today, the, the, part of the differential are blockages in the colon. Mm -hmm. All right? And uh, irritable bowel is, it, it's, it's a, it's a, that's one of the things the differential has to be ruled out. So most of these people end up getting a colonoscopy. Now, if after 50, they need it anyhow. But before 50, many of these people don't really need colonoscopies except to rule out uh, some blockage or problems in the, in the colon. If you would have this positive test, knowing that it's a bacterial overgrowth and you have this uh, vin uh, vin vinculin uh, antibody forming that's causing it, you no longer need to do that colonoscopy. You need to have antibiotics and all the other things that need to be done, which mm. we'll go through in a minute. So in the long run, I think it will end up saving investigation and, and cost. Okay, I got you. It's the right? saving the testing. Yeah. is going to save some money. We're back with uh, Dr. Mensing and... Uh, we're talking IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and I think it's something a lot of people don't fully understand. Well, you know, doctors haven't always understood. In fact, yeah. doctors have not understood. Research this scientists stuff. haven't fully yeah. understood I mean, it we're either. Just, you know, with the stuff with the pathophysiology we went through with about these uh, these antibodies, this is just the start of really understanding this disease. What are I, the symptoms of uh, well, IBS? Well, there's several. When you start, I was just thinking, sixty percent of the people out there listening probably have these. Symptoms. I was going to say, I can, I can probably tell you what they are. But, uh, you but go first, ahead. first is crampy abdominal pain. Right. All right. Number two, a bloated feeling. Yep. Number three, gas. Oh boy. Number four, diarrhea or constipation or, or both. both. Or and, both. Yeah. All right. And uh, mucus in your stool. Now, uh, mucus in your stool. Mm, mm. Now, here's the a few things that we uh, uh, you need to know, and these are there are three symptoms that if you have, you should not be treating yourself, you need to go to a doctor right away, all right? There, there's sort of the three red, hair, red, red lights with the, these kind of symptoms. Number one is if you have rectal bleeding. Any rectal bleeding, you gotta see your doctor, end of discussion, it's this week kind right. of thing. Number not two, just a hemorrhoid or something? No, well, even if you have hemorrhoids, you have to be seen, because here's the problem. You may have hemorrhoids causing rectal bleeding, but I have to prove that you don't have rectal bleeding higher up. Okay. That the hemorrhoids covered. And we'll get into this a little bit, but uh, a lot of people with irritable bowel, have, one of the complications is hemorrhoids. You know, and you, the patient can come in, complain. In fact, I had a guy the other day that came in uh, last Tuesday that com came in and his complaint was hemorrhoids. His problem is, is not really hemorrhoids. He has irritable bowel causing the hemorrhoids. You follow mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah and and the, the, the hemorrhoids are, the, are not the root issue. And, and it's not no good 
I was going to say no good. That's not quite right. It's a symptom of But the, that's a uh, symptom of, of a the, bigger uh, issue. Bigger issue. Right, gotcha. It. But there's three things. Directal bleeding. Number two, unexplained weight loss. If you're not trying to lose weight and you're losing weight, all right? Uh, yeah, and it happens. I had a guy that came in two weeks ago, gentleman, that his wife brought him in, and he lost something like in six months, 25 pounds, and he's not trying to lose weight. Ah, uh, ah, uh, there's something else wrong. and You need to see your doctor right away for that. It's a different story if you're trying to lose weight and you lose it. That's a totally different story, but unexplained weight loss. And the last thing is if you have, have bowel pain at night that wakes you up, then you need mm. to see your doctor, all right? Okay. Because typically gotcha. irritable bowel doesn't bother you at night. At night. It can, but typically not. So if you have pain at night, so that's something else. you need to see your doctor. All so right. that's something else. Yeah, those are the three things that you need it to look It usually kicks into me, the cramping usually kicks in about within the first 30 minutes of getting up. Or of eating, by the way. Some people get it after eating. Oh, after I think eat I've something. really noticed that mm. off and on. But it's pretty much like clockwork within the first half an hour. And I think it's because I've gone from being horizontal where everything's just kind of laying out there yeah. to going vertical and everything's going to drop down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But the gas, I can relate to that because this is gas pain. Huh? I, I, is is uh, is it uh, is it a good idea to take uh, a gas uh, tablet? I mean, I or take gas X or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yes or no? Uh, so so. I, you know, is I'm, it going to hurt? Anything, no, you know? probably not. Probably not. If you're used appropriately, I'm. I'm a. My big concern with that is you're treating the symptoms, not the root issue. Right. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, that, that's really the issue. Uh, you need to treat the root issue, uh, and then if you have a little problems with gas, fine. Use some. Use something. Right. Uh, many of the antacids with cimethicone will help that also. Mm-hmm. The cimethicone component will help the gas part. But uh, it, the, what you don't want is you. You don't want people out there self-treating and not looking at the root issues. They should somewhere along the line be assessed by their doctor and treat the root issues. All right. That, that's kind of important. No. Now, there's a lot of triggers, what we call a doctor's called triggers, that can trigger the, the symptoms, all right? A lot of foods and chocolate. Spicy food can do it. Uh, f- certain types of fruits, beans, milk will often do it. And, in fact, chocolate milk. If you drink chocolate milk and have a lot of trouble with your bowel, very co- often, within days, you'll be constipated. Wow. Do you follow? In fact, you can take... Well, what about the beans? Go back to that for a minute because, uh, you know, I was told that you, that I should be eating... When I had the diverticulitis, you and another doctor and another, actually three, all told me, you need more fiber, you need more sure. fiber, you need more well, fiber. So beans, not a good source of fiber well, if well, you've got it, IBS? It, no, it is a good source of fi- fiber. But there, some, uh, some patients with the beans... Like, for instance, if you have to take Beano you know, mm-hmm. for the gas all the time, if you get uh, abdominal cramping and a lot mm-hmm. of gas when you take beans, it may be, not always, it may be just your normal kind of thing, but it may be that that's a sign of irritable bowel, mm-hmm. all right? But not always. Uh, carbonated drinks, surprisingly, some people get trouble with and can't, they, they, their irritable bowel flares up with it. And so one of the but things... But doesn't that go the other way? Doesn't that go through the kidneys and the bladder? And- yes, but the, the something about the carbonation... In some people, one of the things we do if you have a lot of irritable, if you have ir- questionable irritable bowel or if you have irritable bowel, we will ask you to stop drinking all carbonated beverages okay. beca- and see if it helps because that may be the trigger. Do you follow what I'm saying? Sure. Uh, that you're drinking too many sodas and, uh, was and that time, will stop the problem. What about tea? What about iced tea, for instance? Uh, no, not problems. Okay. Because no. uh, I did notice a while, uh, you know, years ago that I felt like I was getting more after I drank a big, you know, iced tea, just regular old iced yeah. tea. That I would feel kind of crampy and a little little no, pain in the gut. Not, usually, not that I know for okay. irritable bowel. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing you have to remember... Coffee probably that, doesn't help. Uh, uh, well, coffee is not really associated with it. But here's the thing. There's always this every caveat, Jazz. Every patient is different. You know, if I have a patient that comes in and says, you know, every time I drink tea, I get irritable bowel symptoms... It probably works for them. Do you yeah. follow what I'm saying? Sure. And darn it, you better not. You know, better stay away from that kind of thing. But we're talking about in general kind of thing. You know, a cabbage is another one that causes a lot of people get in trouble with. And the last one is very common, especially in this county. I mean, this is the second Bakersfield has the second high, uh, per capita number of alcoholics in the nation. We've talked about that. But there's a high alco- alcohol con- uh, consumption here in Bakersfield. But alcohol can be a trigger for irritable bowel problems, all right? And so those that have irritable bowel, one of the things we do is have them stop for three months to see is it going to work or not. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, alcohol also causes a lot of problems with impotence. In fact, I saw a guy this morning, and he, uh, he drinks a couple of drinks every day, and, in, and on the weekend, up uh, to six or 12 pack a day. Too much, all right? And he can't, he can't figure out. He's a young guy, and he can't figure out why he has impotence, you know? 
the first thing you need to do is stop the alcohol. And alcohol can do the same thing. It can be a trigger for irritable bowel. Uh, if you, uh, let's go over the risk factors, Jess, because mm. there's a bunch of risk factors that are kind of neat to look at. But number one is if you're under age 45, all right, it seldom starts after age 50. All right, you've had it for years before. If you, you know, if you're 50 and you've got irritable bowel, you had it when you were 45, 30. Probably. Just didn't know it, but you, or it may not have been diagnosed. <clears throat> but it it rarely starts de novo, new as a new diagnosis at age 60. All right, that, that really? if you if you're 60 years old and you've never had irritable bowel syndrome before, and you've not come up with irritable bowel syndromes, it becomes incumbent on the physician to work that patient up, say, what else is what else is going on, all right? Because mm. it may be irritable bowel, but the chances is much less. Oh, I got you. Uh, okay. Females have twice the instance of men, all right? So if you're a male with irritable bowel, th- there's much less chance. Most of the, uh, there's two, mo- two times more females that have irritable bowel than males, all right? Uh, <clears throat> family history of irritable bowel is important, okay, as a risk factor. We don't really know why, all right? We don't know the reason why. Hormones, and here's another area. I'm very big into hormones, especially biological hormones, but here's the thing we don't really understand yet. But it is very common that uh, women during menses will have a flare-up of their irritable bowel. Mm. Now, we don't know exactly why yet, okay? This is still investigational, but it is well recognized that 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 happens. Uh, Another thing that's a trigger, and this is why for years uh, a lot of doctors thought it was sort of all in your head, is it stress can aggravate it and make it worse or, or bring it on? It seems to be the yeah, uh, sure. the, the deciding factor in so many different ailments is stress. Yeah. You got yeah. stress. You stress. Got stress. It, I don't it, feel like I have stress, yeah. though. Uh, the other th- well, it, whoa, whoa, Jazz. It's not the, the person that has, uh, you know, that you think is stressed and that, you know, he comes in, curses and swears and kicks a hole in the wall. Yeah. Uh, and you say, oh, he's stressed. That guy will never get your little bowel. All right, <laughs> because he's letting that stress out. All right, maybe inappropriately, but that, uh, it's a person who is, you know, uh, never uh, uh, swears, keeps it all inside, <laughs> and is all buttoned up. And oh, I'm nice and swears. I can't but say I've that would, description. Would love I can't to say I've you know, hit the hit the you know hit the bean bag or the punching bag. But but uh, suppressors that no suppressed stressors are probably more important than what we call stressors. All right. Okay. Now it's uh, or it's our response to the stress. And you know, I saw a guy this morning that was his. He is uh, he's got a business in town, and these are t- he's had a t- these are tough times. All right, I mean, there's tough times, and whether we like it or not, stress makes a difference, Jazz. It does, and it can be one of the triggers for irritable bowel. And if you uh, one of the things that uh, one of the eleven things that has been shown to help irritable bowel is uh, stress reduction counseling, hypnosis, and also uh, yoga. All right, uh, and we don't know why, but it, it definitely makes a difference. Definitely makes a Not difference. Not a chance. We'll <laughs> the hypnosis thing is cool. I'm I'm down for that. I'm not going to do the yoga thing. I'm That's, not sure I'm a fan of hypnosis, but I, <laughs> I'm not doing the yoga thing. Let's get on with uh, the IBS now that we've gotten everybody all stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> we can uh, talk about uh, okay. The IBS. Uh, let's go over uh, a few things. All right. Uh, one of the things we didn't mention on the risk factors, the last thing I want to talk about with that is mental health problems are shown to be a risk factors. Anxiety, depression, personality uh, disorders. Mm. Uh, female with domestic abuse at home, increased risk, and childhood ki- kids with sexual abuse in their past. Wow. The risk goes way, way up for irritable bowel. It's interesting. We, we mentioned several things that you need to watch for it that are red flags to doctors, all right, the need for the workup. We mentioned hemorrhoids, okay? If you have hemorrhoids, especially with the constipation or the mixed type irritable bowel, you have to look and see, is this just hemorrhoids or why are the hemorrhoids there? Mm-hmm. Do you follow what I'm saying? Sure. Uh, you know, you, that's just, we talked about that. Uh, we have some patients, this is quite rare nowadays, but we have some patients who uh, have done what we call food avoidance, but they know that this food causes troubles, this food causes this, and pretty soon they're down to the, you know, eating crackers and, 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 uh, exactly. and sodas or something like that, you know, and they get malnourished. Uh, and the last thing is part of the workup for depression, and, and I was going to say more than depression, but people who are discouraged, all right, have sort of given up and ready to check out, and they're depressed, but discouragement with depression has been shown to have a high correlation with their Discouraged and depression such as the loss 
of a family member or a yeah, friend? Well, more than that, with no hope of getting anywhere. You know, one of the things we do in depression screening, maybe we should talk about this someday, but is I want, one of the things I look for when I'm talking to you is not that you're depressed, but how hopeful are you that things will get better? We'll get better. If you're hopeless, wow, these are people are high risk for a lot of bad things happening, but that hopelessness part of uh, depression is very much associated, one of the risk factors for irritable bowel. Wow. All right? That's interesting. Now, what are the things that we should... Oh, let's go over the foods that are good. All right? That okay, we're eat. running out of time, so we probably should move this along. Well, why don't we do this? Let's go over the recommendations then. Yeah, let's do the let's recommendations. Do Number one is probiotics. All right? Uh, take them every yeah, day. Every, and we recommend if you if you have your... How many times a day? Twice? I, once? Uh, I would take three uh, capsules oh, three. every meal for six weeks minimum. Oh, wow. Number two, you need to have a cultural sensitivity and an oven parasite of your stool. Your doctor will do that. Number three, you can use uh, antidiarrheals like Imodium and Alomatil as needed as long as you've been worked up correctly for the diagnosis. Yeah, okay, okay. As so long as the diagnosis is sure, and there's other things I've been looking at. I was going to ask you about that because doesn't that, wouldn't that also cause constipation? But if you have the constipation and you've yes, got the diarrhea, exactly. it's going to. Okay, uh, mm. bile acid binding agents like cholestyramine, a lot of doctors use. Uh, it's fairly old treatment, very cheap. Uh, there's new two new medicines: uh, Zyphan for diarrhea patients, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Lotronex uh, for people with uh, diarrhea. There's a bit of a problem with it. There's slightly increased problems with uh, with ischemic bowel in older people. Uh, osmotic diuretics. That's things like uh, Miralax, and you buy it over the counter. It actually, it's probably in Geico. Uh, but milk and magnesia, uh, things oh, like that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the uh, recommend trying a lactose-free diet for about. Six weeks to three months to no, see if that no makes milk. you. Yes, because it will change possibly. There's, uh, it, it may, uh, you may have lactose intolerance with irritable bowel or only that, and it helps to sort that out. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So now, you'd stop. Is that something you develop at some point? Or, or yes, you can have a, you know, Many people develop lactose intolerance really? in their 30s or 40s. I thought it was something that was with you all your no, life. No, no, no. I'll no. be darned. All right, uh, <clears throat> let's go over. Uh, so we try a lactose-free diet, uh, stress re- reduction, uh, uh, you know, things like uh, counseling, peppermint oil. No, wait, what? Peppermint oil, prim- evening primrose oil, and fish oil. Three things you buy over the counter, they're cheap, have been shown to help, all right? Oh, now, it, it's, these are, uh, are more of a, I was going to say shown, they haven't been proven. That's maybe a better way to say it. But there is a lot of evidence that they help, all right? But there's been no studies to say that. And the last thing is acupuncture. Amazingly enough, in fact, what? yes, in fact, we have a, a, a person who's very good at acupuncture that we refer sometimes patients to in specialized Is that cases. covered by insurance? No, most, <laughs> mo, the, most not. But phenomenal, I mean, if, it, you know, if you come to me and say, I, I, you know, we have a phenomenal doctor who does, you know, does very good acupuncture, and amazing things can happen. Amazing. Ear to a bowel. Treat it with ear acupuncture. All right? You won't try anything, yeah. really. So <laughs> to point. me, that's quite amazing. And that, those are the eleven things that at the, uh, that we would uh, in our mind go through. I've been training. going through this. I'll be honest with you. I've been going through this for years, and it's an off and on thing. Sometimes so, you know it's off and on. And just when I'm thinking, okay, that's it. I got I got to go get some tests done. Then it goes away. Go, yeah, ah, well, that's very classic. But very classic. And it's gone. And, and yeah. either stress and change or you those, stop the you, triggers. You watch. There's a commercial where it shows this woman, and she's walking through. I think she's at a carnival or a fair. Or something like that, and she's walking along, and she's eyeballing every bathroom as she walks through this through this uh, this uh, event, well, and that's what I find myself doing, no matter where I'm at. Well, you know, Jazz, there's several, there's five foods. That, uh, the last thing we'll mention, there's five foods that help irritable bowel. Okay, All let's right? run through those. Rhubarb. 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 I haven't barley, had rhubarb since I was a kid. Tangerine peels, licorice, and ginger. Tangerine peels. Peels. Of Eating the peel? Yes. Peeling? Yes. You mean really? Now you make sure you scrub them beforehand, get all the toxic pesticides off of you. Well, yeah, but, but uh, interestingly, tangerine peels. You eat it? What do you do? You put it in a blender? I'd uh, probably blend it up and make a smoothie out of it. But yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, you know. I can't just see they're sitting there but, eating uh, a, 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 the but, peeling off of So the it, there's definitely, even foods can help ameliorate the symptoms. All right? So, uh, not, so you, don't, you might not need drugs if you can do it the natural way yeah, like that. My experience, I'm not sure foods are the total answer. You know, I, 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 th- I look at it as cheap and safe and, and very little downside and do it. Why not right, do it kind right. of thing? But uh, I'm not sure that in most cases it's the answer. It's all part of the answer. All right? Okay. So there you have it, folks. And uh, the other, you know, you, what is, uh, 
what there is something I was going to ask you. What is something similar to this? Is it colitis? Now, you can get actually colitis or inflammatory bowel you know, disease. what is that? That's where the uh, uh, irritable bowel means that the bowel is normal. Now, there are some gap junction issues, which is uh, this, uh, another side issue that uh, may are susceptible to it. But irritable bowel, the, think of it, the bowel is normal, but the motility is screwed up because of these toxins that are causing antibodies to the vernacular. Now, colitis, though, is? Colitis, the bowel itself, either the small bowel or the large bowel, is screwed up. And there's a problem with the bowel itself and, and the that, bowel wall. That requires surgery. Well, depends what it is and what it's from, all right? But if you have, let's say, ulcerative colitis that's, or, or Crohn's at times, Crohn's is another Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease, that's But those yeah. two, those have more chance of surgery. In fact, there's a definite, in fact, if you have uh, ulcerative colitis for more than seven to ten years, you need to prophylactically take out your colon or else you're going to get cancer. It's over kind oh, of thing. Man. All right? Oh, but that's a totally different illness, Jazz, because in that ulcerative colitis, the bowel wall is screwed up. This is not a, the Can irritable this? bowel syndrome. The, the bowel wall is essentially normal. It's not a bowel wall okay. problem. It's a nerve what problem. Would you, what would you do to test for that, for colitis or for well, Crohn's? Well, remember those uh, several things we said. Number one, pain at night, or, okay. blood in your stool, gotcha. or losing weight. All right? Those, those are the things that you have to remember. Well, I've been losing weight, but that's because... Well, but you're trying to lose weight. That's a different no, story. No, I'm just taking metformin, which causes a slight weight loss. Over a period You're of time. You're telling too much about your health history here. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, I'm just a straightforward guy here on the radio. You know, I just talk like I do when I'm sitting in the bar room you know, with my pals and my buddies, you know. Yeah, I got to go poop. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's, it's interesting. It's 16%. Jazz, that's one in five people out there who are listening to us today probably that have, have this. And, and if you think of it that way, probably most people listening today either know, have it or know someone who does. Uh, Dr. That's Jan amazing. Mensing from the practice, ladies and gentlemen. Doc, we'll uh, we'll see you next uh, next Monday. Uh, is next Monday or Monday after? Uh, it's, it's the next Monday. Next Monday. Oh, is Doc it next Monday? Be, okay, we'll uh, be here. Coming in. And don't forget, if you missed uh, the earlier portions of anything that Dr. and I talk about. Go to the website, drmensink.com. And also knzr.com. We've yeah. got them there yeah. on uh, what they call yeah. it, a pod uh, webcam cast or something like that. It's the a link. The link. It's a link to a to pod, his to his podcast. Okay, Correct. gotcha. And that's how it works. Okay. So, so yeah. Yeah. So, it takes us usually about two weeks to get the programs on. All right, but, but it's they're all there. It's they're always little, good to you know go yeah. back and yeah. There's a lot of information. If you go to uh, drmensink.com or the practice website, there's just a phenomenal. Every week we're putting three or four different. Uh, uh, videos about different health problems for our for our patients. The web, our that part of the web is we look at it not as you know a lot of webs are for selling. This is not really for selling, but to help our patients. That's right. That's it's right. really neat. A lot of good information. There. Very cool. All right, Doc. We'll see you in, a, in next uh, Monday then. Sounds good. Think of the practice like a doctor from 50 years ago. No long waits for appointments. 40% of our appointments are seen same day. No rushed appointments and access to phenomenal amount of discounts. We have the time to do good medicine. We're also focused on the emotional, the spiritual, dietary. All of those things feed in. We do more than most urgent cares do because we have the expertise, the skills, and the equipment to do it. We're able to do that top quality medicine, have that phenomenal access for less than a cup of coffee. I joined the practice for a number of reasons. One, I knew Jan Mensing for many years. He's a superb doctor and I have appreciated his expertise in other areas. It's very affordable. Medications, he's worked out deals with pharmacies. One medication I get for free would cost me $300. What I like best about the practice is the availability and accessibility. At times I'm able to get in in two or three hours. They deeply care about their patients here in an extraordinary way, which is unusual in today's modern medicine in most places. My husband and I joined the practice three years ago. Uh, we could not afford medical care at the time. Not long after we joined, my husband had a spider bite and he got very ill within a day. I was terrified that we were gonna have to put him in the hospital, which I knew we're looking at $40,000, $50,000. We brought him in and Dr. Mensing saved his life. We were able to come in here every day without any extra charges. I love Dr. Mensing. He's wonderful. And I will never ever forget how Dr. Mensing was with us. My family and I have been members of the practice for the past two years. I joined the practice because I wanted to find a place where my family could be treated without taking a lot of time. But what we like about the practice is that uh, if our kids are sick or we're sick, we need medical attention, they'll take us usually the same day. They treat you very well, it's not very expensive, it's affordable, 
I like that the practice is always there for us. Nos unimos con The Practice para que nuestra familia tenga muy buenos eficaces doctores. Nos gusta mucho porque si uno de mis hijos está enfermo, nos meten de forma inmediata, por lo general el mismo día. Lo que más me gusta de Practice es que hablan mi idioma. Es un plan muy económico y que atienden a uno muy bien. Lo que más me gusta de The Practice es que siempre están ahí para mi familia. Cuando llegué a, a la oficina y vi al doctor Messi, yo llegué y me sentía débil, muy débil. Yo había visto muchos doctores y no me arreglaban el problema. Pero cuando llegué aquí al doctor Messi, él me hizo un chequeo, un examen completo y, y encontró el problema y, y me ayudó, me dio el tratamiento que necesitaba. Y ahora me siento con mucha energía y estoy muy contento aquí. Él es un excelente doctor. Estoy seguro que les dará ayuda tal como lo hizo conmigo.